I'm not sure I understand. People pay you to kidnap them. For the simulated experience of high-stakes seduction, yes. Case file 402. Subject, Anna St. Blair. Subject has requested a surprise scenario. She won't know when it's coming, or where, or how. <laughs> Listen, Anna, this can go very smoothly for you, or very difficultly. What? She's good. Authorities are still searching today for a Hollywood Hills woman. Oh, mother of Anna? I'm gonna need some answers. I already told you that I am not who you think I am. You're treading very dangerous waters. <laughs> You're in some very serious shit. Stop yelling in my face! You know what this is. You called me on the phone. You paid for this. Yours was a special case. Let me guess, Ray. You got carried away. Are you Raymond Moody? We're here about a lady who went missing last night. Isn't it a little early to open a missing persons investigation? I watch a lot of cop shows. I think you like tying people up. Nine and a half times out of ten, I'm really not a bad person. Mr. Moody, have a good weekend. Give me the keys. It's not a real gun. What? It's not a real gun, it's just a pellet gun. Oh! Hi, Ricky. Mr. Healy, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on your film. Thank you so much. Directed by, starring yourself and, and Taylor Schilling. And my wig. And your, and your wig. How did this, uh, you didn't write this film. I know that you wrote the last film that you directed, right? And you've written uh, a short, before. yeah. So uh, how, did this, how did this script come your way? I was making a short film with a bunch of brown, uh, recent brown graduates, and uh, a guy named Travis Bogosian was the director. He's Eric Bogosian's son. And Lorraine Nicholson, who's Jack Nicholson's daughter. She was the production and costume designer. And uh, this guy, Mike Mikowski, uh, who had gone to school with them, was the uh, producer. And uh, he and I became friends. He was, I think, 23 years old at the time. Uh, he was a fan of my work. He'd seen all my movies. Um, and then we talked a lot. And then, I don't know, six months later, he said, I wrote this script. Would you read it? And I thought, well, read a script and give him notes on it or something. And uh, it was a script he had written for me to act in, and I loved it. And uh, I was talking with my friend Evan Katz, who I've done a few movies with, very excitedly, and he said, it sounds like you should direct it. And I went, oh yeah, okay. Because I had never thought about directing something I hadn't written before. And uh, I told Mike that, and he said, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, and I Why's thought, that? well, I think he was just, He's very, he was, he was very young and green at the time. I think it worried him. And I thought, well, I better like legitimize this in some way for him so he doesn't think I'm just kind of screwing around. So I called two people that I know, uh, independent producers, uh, Adela Romanski, who was unavailable because she was uh, scouting locations in Miami for a movie called Moonlight, which you may have heard of. And um, then I called uh, Jay Duplass. I emailed him and I said, uh, I'm thinking of doing this, I have this script, I think I might want to direct it. He called me on his way home from, he was shooting Transparent, and uh, he, I, uh, he asked me to give him the pitch, basic pit premise, um, and uh, I an did. Incredible premise, like it's, yeah. it is an elevator pitch. I mean, just perfect, that, yeah. just that, the premise alone, you know, a guy who you hire to kidnap you um, is great and original, I've never heard of that before. And, uh, and then Jay uh, sent it to Mel Eslin, who is the producer who's producing all of these new movies for them. And she read it. I met her the next day and said, we want to do this with you. I said, I can not direct it or not act in it if, you wanna, if you're worried about that. I'm like, no, no, no. What, what actress do you want from this list of people? And that was August. And by April, we were shooting a year wow. ago. And how did you get Taylor involved? She had worked with them on a movie called The Overnight. And um, 
when you work in Hollywood, you, you, you spend a lot of time sending scripts out to agents and things. And it's just, it's really hard to attach people, get people to read. But if you know someone, and they certainly know a lot of people, and a lot of people love and respect them, you can send it to them and say, like, we think this is really great, you'd be really good, and it's a great part. And, and so that's what, we did a little rewriting on it and sent it to her, I think, in, that was August. I think she got it in November. And she said yes right away. So, wow. and I didn't know her. I came here about a month later to meet her. And we just talked for, like, we had spoken on the phone, but I, we talked for about, I don't know, four hours one day in Brooklyn, and I was like, great. She's, Let's go. she's the person, yeah. So you're, you're, you're starring and you're directing in this. Was that difficult? Did you find it hard to be sort of in front of the camera as well as behind the camera? I found it remarkably, surprisingly easy to... Uh, all the pre-production and shooting. Uh, I did a ton of prep. I'm a huge cinephile. I've been basically been preparing to direct a movie my whole life. So I just worked everything out with uh, my cinematographer, Mel, who was a producer, who would be at the monitor yelling action and cut. Uh, what directors did you look at going into this? Did you have like a, oh, a sort of a, a lookbook of, of, uh, of films that you were looking at? So or, many or? things. I mean, because the movie's like half a screwball comedy and half a noir, we took a lot of the visuals from, you know, a lot of 70s movies. So first, like Gordon Willis, movies that Gordon Willis shot with uh, Alan Pakula, so like the, the Parallax View. There's a lot, like all the President's Men, uh, uh, it's a much, Clute, that was a big one. Like much brighter than it's a much Gordon brighter. Willis I mean, because it's a comedy, one in a different direction. I mean, we looked at certain things like uh, in terms of framing more than lighting. Uh, uh, he had, uh, everybody talks about Gordon Wells' lighting and being dark and everything, but he has a very like specific framing that he does. You know, if you look at like, Manhattan, a lot of like the framing is half the frame is the wall, and the person is like just a little bit. And this was sort of about like people who were lonely and isolated. I, we would take screen grabs of movies and send them to each other, and unconsciously certain themes would develop. So like, the first thing was everyone had, like, every picture that I sent had a lamp in it that was lighting the thing, like just like a, a lamp from the 70s or something. And then I realized I kept sending pictures of a, a person alone in a giant room, you know, not even thinking about that. And that's sort of like, these characters are sort of lonely and, and isolated and, and they, they find each other in this weird way, but um, I think that's that's sort of where that came from. And then certainly thematically, screwball comedies like uh, 20th Century, which is a Howard Hawks movie, and uh, also Hawks uh, Bringing Up Baby, and uh, Nothing Sacred. It's a Carol Lombard. Uh, Taylor reminded me very much of Carol Lombard, so a William Weldman movie from I think it's 1936. And then uh, in the 80s, there were like these... Um, screwball noir kind of movies, hybrids. So mannequin, no. Yeah, mannequin two on the move with Meshach Taylor. <laughs> on the move was the subtitle. Um, I forgot. Yeah, no. Uh, after hours, of course, he made after hours, and certainly King of Comedy. Tonally, that's my favorite movie. So, like, I'm always trying to find that weird tone somehow, which is like tension and comedy together. Uh, something wild, a, Jonathan that, Demi. Something wild is yeah. maybe my favorite movie. It's the it's one of mine. There's yeah. no, there, I I can't think of another film that blends tone as seamlessly. Yeah, as and something it becomes wild. a completely different movie at some point. You know, when you see Ray Liotta for the first time, and you've never seen him in a movie before. He'd never been in a movie before, and it's just like. But even then, with something wild, and we're here to promote your movie, not something yeah. wild, but. He appears, we'll but it doesn't still, it doesn't abruptly shift no. then. So and he like, he appears and then it starts going like this. And then all of a sudden you realize you're in the middle of a different movie. That's right. And literally the lighting changes in the scene. The lights, it's in a, it's at a, a high school reunion and the lights go down in the room and then, and then everything becomes darker in the movie from there on. And I rewatched it recently and there's that great sequence after they leave the convenience store in that yeah. movie where they're in the hotel room. Right. There's this incredible scene that's like 10 minutes long in the where hotel he kicks room. the hole in the <laughs> Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. But it's also just a great, again, like sort of initiator into this new world that you're going yes. into. Yes. So something wild going back to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Into the Night, you know, John Lannis's movie is also... They're all sort of like um, Jeff Goldblum and Michelle Pfeiffer. It's like screwball comedy and noir, what they had in common was like some schlub being led down a rabbit hole by a, you know, alluring, beautiful, but crazy, slightly crazy or totally crazy woman, usually a blonde. That's so interesting because the flip side of this is that it's... Uh, 
he's supposed to be the one leading someone down a rabbit hole sure. rather than vice versa. Which yeah, and it, it, it's constantly sort of being flipped, you know, and, you know, she's a femme fatale and a, and a screwball comedy heroine, you know. And was that what drew you to this? Was the idea of being able to play with genre so much and sort of consistently flipping back and forth throughout the movie? Yeah, I think not at first. I mean, I, unconsciously, but, you know, as it did it more, it was about a person who bases his whole life on an outdated you know, ideas of old movies. He wears this leather jacket like Al Pacino wears in Carlito's Away or De Niro wears in Midnight Run. And he wears the gloves and the turtleneck like Steve McQueen and Bullet and the sunglasses, you know, with Serpico and, and uh, this dumb hair that's, you know... And it's, it's all sort of like these ideas of masculinity that he's, that he's, you know, created based on old movies. You know, there's a scene where he watches an old movie early on and it's and it's a relationship between a man and a woman which is really strange I won't give it away but he's he's romanticized it all these things in a strange way and he's kind of trying to create his own world his own movie and it just when she comes into it it doesn't it she she sort of like you know breaks that all down for him well, uh, she it's sort of like Max Fisher in, in Rushmore you know he he's always trying to sort of like production design everything but this guy's too old to be getting away with that anymore, and so it's... Well, she kind of shows how fragile and thin the world that he's right. created is. And how really know? very not good he is at, at, at what he claims to be good at. Everyone's kind of been playing along, but, like, it's very easy to... Right. Yeah, yeah and, anything and, and it's about actors, too, and about living in L.A. So we talk about the loneliness and the, the you know, being isolated and everything, but they're both sort of actors. I mean, they're not literally actors, but they're both role-playing and um, as actors, you know, that, that, was, that was fun to do, too. Um, You're, uh, I mean, I think people would refer to you as a character actor. Is that, is sure. that fair? I mean, yeah. wonderful parts in, like, an incredible amount of movies. If you go down Pat's IMDb, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, oh, my God, yes, yes. One thing that I always loved was uh, your role in Magnolia. You have that, ah. the great scene where Julianne Moore screams at you in the, in the pharmacy. Yeah, somebody was just asking me if there was ever a time when I was acting with someone and I, like, like came out of it and was just sort of like watching them act. Uh, that was one of those moments. Really? Yeah. I mean, I was definitely in, but I was also outside. I also did a TV show years ago with James Caan and he was beating me up and I suddenly <laughs> like exited my body and was watching, you know, Sonny Corleone beat me up. Right. Were you like, just hit me in the head with a trash can, please, <laughs> yeah, just yeah, do it. Yeah. Pull off my shoe and yeah. like, yank at me. <laughs> Yeah, um, I didn't go quite that far, but uh, he's a very funny man. He's like one of the funniest people I've ever worked with. He's a quick wit. How, how have you sort of defined your place as an, as an actor? Because you're always in good movies with great directors. Well, I love movies. I, I have since I was a little kid. And so, I mean, it's funny. It's just sort of happened that way. I, I, I suppose there's something unconscious about the things that I'm drawn to or the people that are drawn to me. Um, but to be honest, I've just been working for a really long time and I audition like everybody else and I get a part or I don't, but, uh, I've been very fortunate that, I mean, look, I've done, I don't know, 40 hours of television guest starring on TV shows, some great shows, some, you know, not so great shows. I mean, 8,000 hours of me sitting across the table from someone on CBS, a doctor, or a lawyer, or a cop questioning me. And me saying the line, all right, I was there, but I didn't do it. You know, I was always the red herring guy. I mean, I've done so much of that, Played too. the red herring guy several oh times? Oh, my God. And it's always like you get it three days before or the day before, and it's like, am I going to have a mustache or glasses or, or I'll comb my hair for it because you... You have no time to make any other choices or decisions. Is that something that comes because you audition, or at a certain point, casting directors know you as a great red herring, and so I, they're like, Pat, I hope we need not. a red herring. Yeah, I think, you know, it ultimately comes down to, like, a look, and you get a good read in the room, and, and they feel like they can talk to you like a human being, and you get hired. Now I'm older, people know me. Like, as you said, I have a body of work, and so it's I'm not auditioning as much, um, and I'm being offered things more. And I'm creating my own opportunities. So, um, yeah, character actor, like, you know, I mean, it used to bother me because it's like, I, don't, I think it was Kevin Spacey who said, like, that that, that means that the person you don't want to have sex with, actor. But, like, you know. Um, hey, man, you took compliance. Not <laughs> made, so yeah. Well, that certainly was. Compliance was a, 
you know, my friend Craig Zobel, who I did Great World of Sound with, I just... Incredible film. Yeah, it was incredible. It's a great movie. It's, you know, you need a shower afterwards, but uh, it, 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 uh, it, it was something I gave pause to doing because it was a really dark role. And that was, like, hard for me personally. And also, I think maybe there's the risk of being typecast and things. And But I've played villains since then, and I've played nice people since then, and I've played characters like this in between, so... Um, this is sort of a complex character, and it has a lot of comedy in it, which I love doing and don't always get a chance to do, but also I get to play all the layers of complexity of this character, as you said, fragility and do you vulnerability. Feel like, do you feel like you don't get to play comedy that often? Because I feel like in, in, in roles where even if it's a dramatic role, yeah. you have a natural comedy to Well, it. I'm always putting it in there because I, I think I've just sort of always been naturally funny since I was a kid, but it was strange when I got to Hollywood that... I guess I just looked intense or serious or something. I almost never got cast in those things. Well, what? I think about I think about compliance for yeah. some, for instance, which is a very serious movie. Right. Your you I, I remember laughing numerous times <laughs> at, at things that you did in your performance that were trying to show how much of a a, a fool this guy was. Or how banal he is. Yeah. yeah. You know, he makes a sandwich while he's doing this horrible thing. Yeah. The idea was sort of that I shot all my stuff separately. I was on the phone with them, literally and the camera was on them, but I never saw any of it. So the idea was that for him, this was just a, he was like being a jerky boy, you know? Like he was just having a fun, a prank. Like if he ever saw it, you know, he could never do something like that in person. But it was like just fun to him. So I never played that he was the evil Twitter or, commentator. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that was really before even Twitter was, you know, had taken off. Like it really, I definitely know who that troll is. He's the ultimate troll now, you know? Um, he, he has taken over the world, um, or at least this country. But, uh, yeah, th that's very much what that was. And so, yeah, I'm always trying to find what's interesting, even if it's a little piece of behavior or something. And, and it just usually ends up being funny. I was listening to this uh, interview with Eugene Levy on uh, the Mark Maron podcast, uh, WTF, and he was saying he wanted to be a dramatic actor, but he would go into these rooms and start yelling, or, or you know, this dramatic scene, everybody would start laughing. And, you know, he became Eugene Levy, you know. Uh, and I, it made me laugh hearing that. And I think it's almost almost, almost kind of the opposite for me. Like, I, I just, I'm always trying to be funny, but you know, people always cast me as, like, a serial killer. Or One time I played a um, mentally challenged pedophile on a show about a blind cop. That's true. You can look it up. He's got a lot going for it. Yeah, he's a blind cop who carried a gun. I don't... What yeah. show was that? It was called Blind Justice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was a Stephen Bochco show. And my guess is I got that is because everyone, no one on earth wanted to do that part. Um, and I, 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 I can't imagine why. But, like, he would... He would... Uh, Ron Elder, who's a great actor, he, he, he would come in and he had the sunglasses and he had the gun. He'd be like... Like Daredevil, he'd be like, oh, that that's a, a, a A2 type fly. The body's buried over there, you know. <laughs> I don't know if he ever pulled his weapon, but. With, uh, with this character, I mean, you talk about walking that fine line between serial killer or what people identify as menacing and comedy. And I think you do that consistently in this film. Yeah. When you read the script and saw yourself in it, where you're like, oh, this is where I can use these two things that I know I love and that I'm good at, and I can really bring them to the forefront together here. Yeah, I think so. I think when he tries to be menacing, it's funny. Well, or when I, he tries to be cool, it's, it's, it's his idea of what he thinks cool is, and it's, it's outdated, and it's, he's not there's, cool. You know? There's always a question as to how far he's going to go, though, because anybody who's going to have a company like this, and his company is kidnapping people, could potentially take it too far, get too wrapped up in it. That's right, and he does. He a... gets lost in it at times, and you see him lose his cool, and, and uh, although you don't know if it's an act or what, but you, you've, you've, you know enough about him at that point without giving too much away to know that he's not acting anymore. He's really pissed off, you know? Or is he? And I think, you know, you're always guessing about these characters, but in particular, you know, Taylor, what Taylor does is, is pretty remarkable because she can turn on a... A dime and be in one scene you know one take she's hilarious and then she's crying and it's terribly sad and then she's angry and it's really intimidating and scary and and all the way around and you're always kind of wondering you know what what she's up to and that's sort of like 
you can be my character and go down the rabbit hole and follow her, uh, you know, because you're just like, what is going on with her, you know? Well, it's a great performance, and I'd imagine for an actress seeing that performance or seeing that character on the page, it would be hard to say no to that because there's so much that you get to do there. It's all about her performance. Or yeah, all about the performance it is. Itself. I agree. I, I, I think the movie really works because of that performance, and, and I... I thought at first I was a little worried because of some of the trickier, darker things she has to do that it would be hard to get an actress. But I was as soon as I gave it to Mark and Jay and Mel, they, they told me quite the opposite. And they rolled out a list of people that they were certain they could give it to and wanted to do it. Wow. And I, I immediately gravitated to her for the reasons you know I stated before. She was, she's a great actress. She can do drama and comedy, but she also can play an actress playing an actress and playing, you know, uh, the screwball comedy element. You know, we see her on Orange is the New Black doing, you know, uh, being very funny and being very dramatic and, and being very crazy at times. And, um, you know, she's, she has great range. And I say that not just when people say that they often mean that People can play any number of different parts, but she has great range within one role, you know. That's very difficult to do, so. How difficult was your time in the editing room, given that you're playing with very. your own so much? My editor, Brian, is here, actually. He's great, genius, and also held my hand a lot. It was difficult to watch myself, uh, you know, defending your life, the Albert Brooks movie. He goes uh, to Judgment City, uh, which is a place you go to heaven, before you go to heaven, to watch clips of your <laughs> the mistakes you made in your life and have other people judge you about them. The only way you really can watch yourself, though, is if you're editing yourself. There's yeah, well, I'm way. convinced he wrote that movie. I mean, I, I'd have to ask him if I ever met him, but that, 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 that had to be because he directs himself in his movies, and it's just it's masochistic at some point. It's just really... It was really hard on myself. And this is vanity and things, you know, not so much the performance, but... So it was easy shooting because I was prepared, but that, that part was difficult, and it's long. I mean, we, we started cutting in May, and I'm really just finishing the movie now, so. Wow, really? So it took almost a year. Yeah, we cut for about four months, I think. I mean, we weren't cutting all that time, but we went, and I went and did a TV pilot, like learned how to ride a horse and all kinds of stuff, and then came back, and we mixed the sound, and we did the color correction, and there's always something every day that, that we have to do. You get another call, you know, go through the titles, and there's misspellings and all kinds of things like that. But, yeah, we're really just just finishing it took took a took a solid year did you find that crafting the tone though that the tone ended up really coming through the editing process yeah. because a movie like this it's shifting consistently you're i mean did you shoot for several different variations of performance so you could do that in the we movie? did and then we, what we found that, that really worked was using the different variations within because Zobel does that a lot too you know using the different you know she would do it different ways but we would use the different ways within one the take or one scene, you know, um, that really gave a great quality to it. But it was difficult. We showed it to a lot of people and we kept trying to get the tone right because it's not a tone that's done a lot and, you know, and even it's kind of a new tone, I think, in a way. Um, and then we finally felt like we got it, but it was when we got the music, which Heather McIntosh wrote, that's when it, w it was like, okay, now this is, this is right. This is what makes sense. Like this... This is finally selling the tone. It was like you have temp music from other movies and things, and people didn't know to, whether to laugh or to, you know, be tense or whatever. And she got it just right. She's she's great. She did compliance as well. I think that was her first score, and you know, I wanted her for this, and she really sold it. And I hear from a lot of people that they love the score in the movie. The score is but, wonderful. The score is very much feels like a throwback. To, yeah, it's like yeah. a '60s uh, caper, Henry Mancini. Uh, 60s John Barry, you know, if Chris Filed the Knack and things like that. Uh, the Mancini, you know, did the Pink Panther and Charade and things like that. Uh, yeah, it just, we landed on that late though. Like we were trying to figure it out the whole time and we didn't write the music until she was working like December and January and in January I think is when we really got all the music. What was your most distressing moment in the process of making the movie? The, mo the moment where you're like, Shh, what am I doing? I don't think I got this. Fuck. <laughs> I mean, the whole editing process, you can ask Brian. <laughs> I, I think... Because you said, you know, we came to this late. That means that you had one idea that maybe then didn't end up working out, so you had to look, look for another one, and you're hunting, and then you come to this idea for the score being like this, and you're like, oh, that, 
makes sense for the movie. And that's just common for the process of most movies. It is, I'm told, but being my first time really doing it, it was it was very trying. I think even for the 30th time, you know, it's still like... Uh, yeah, uh, that's what I've heard. Yeah, I... I I think there was there was a point in the middle where I just was just so depressed because I just felt like we had shown it to enough people and everyone always liked it. I mean, they liked it from the first cut, but it just wasn't. I'm like, I I know I know what this is. I know it's there. It's it, but it just takes time because you can't just like anything when you're really focused too hard on it. You can't. You need time and space away from it to like come up with that new idea. You know. Or I would come in the next day and Brian would have tried something new or or Mel or Mark or Jay would have weighed in on an idea or somebody at one of the screenings would say, like, I didn't get it. Like, you know, for for a long time, there's a scene in the beginning of the movie where I go to a woman's house and I, uh, you know, she gives me kind of a stinky look and then I'm playing with some kids in the backyard and I try and talk to her and she won't talk to me. And uh, everyone that saw it thought it was my ex-wife, everyone, and she's my sister. And I was like, how did we not know that? And it's just basic movie kind of, you know, math that people do. It's, people are used to movies and the way they're made, and they all thought that. It was another thing with, there's these interrogations that I do with her where people weren't laughing, and I was like, why aren't they getting it? And I was like, oh, because I didn't set up that premise properly and it's very easily solved with a little voiceover you have somebody come in or I come in and do a little and we did a lot of different versions of the voiceover I do like a little like noirish you know detective narration or we have the sister leave a voicemail and she says hey it's your sister I mean things you wouldn't notice you'd think were always there if you were watching the movie for the first time but like oh wow I can't believe we just fixed that because we couldn't go back and reshoot it or anything we had to one of the weird things of the movie making process too because we sort of talk about visionaries and auteurs all the time and even oh please please <laughs> my head's gonna get it too big no 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 but this idea that like they have a vision immediately yeah. and that's what comes out right away the actors act and then they edit and it's very easy and it's like even for the best of the best it's this long process where you're still scraping around in the dirt trying yeah. to find the best idea and you and forget because you're in your own head you forget that certain information has to get laid right. out and you feel dumb because you're like oh that seems so obvious why didn't i think of that well and the strange thing too is that it all does end up at the end the, the way that you saw it but it's like everything in life you know you're going here but it's not a straight you know it goes like that the other thing was a wig um it clearly is a wig it was clearly intended to the first shot is of me and, and and i wanted people to laugh but because it was a low budget movie and we were mostly showing it to our friends you know and people in the independent film circle Everyone kind of was like, oh, my God, do they have shitty, does he think that looks good and stuff? <laughs> Everyone thought that it was like... <laughs> yeah, that I thought was like trying to convince people that that was my real hair, you know? Um, especially if you see me in a movie before, like, you know, you know that's not my real hair. But it's like, you know, clearly, deliberately silly. So we had to put in some references to, to it earlier. The answering machine line, right? Right yeah. at the beginning where the sister says, don't bring Yeah, the and then we, we, even, we even put one in there, I'll defy people to find, and Taylor does, and you can't even tell. Like, we, we just had to record something on our phone, and we laid it on there, and it just like, perfectly synced up with where her head had to be turned at that moment, but she didn't actually say it when we shot it. We just, we just put it in there later. So I hope I'm not ruining things, telling people how the sausage is made too much, but... Uh, no, not at all. I think you know, that, that stuff's really interesting. It's not always... Yeah, you, 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 don't, know, you don't realize till you get in the editing room that you, like, totally forgot to do that it's, thing. It, it sounds pretentious, but I think it's important for young filmmakers or people starting out to hear yeah. about all the mistakes and all of the dirt scraping that it takes to make a movie because... There are so many stops and starts, and there are so many failures along the way of even just one project to get to the end. Yeah, and I would say to like young filmmakers, you want to do a lot of prep. You really want to like, I think you should know or at least have an idea of what every shot's going to be, have an idea of what every edit's going to be. You know, as the actor, of course, you know the script backwards and forwards as well as the director. You know every line as the actor, and and things will change because they have to or because you know this doesn't work or that or on the day you don't we lost the location we have to shoot it somewhere else we have to refigure it out but as long as you have that basic framework i think then you can from there you can you know uh, come up with another solution um i think when you, if 
you're trying to wing it, you, especially you shot for 18 days and, you know, very, very tiny shoestring budget. You don't have time to, you know, or, or the money to go like, oh, we'll just get another location or we'll just do it this way or we'll go and reshoot that. You know, you, you have to just figure something else out. It looks great. It doesn't. Thank you. Yeah, it doesn't look like a shoestring budget at all. Before I turn to the audience, I, I, I'm curious. You know, as we said, you, you have a body of work, 40 films. You've worked with an incredible amount of actors, like Julianne Moore, Magnolia, James Caan, uh, number of movies. Who was the toughest actor for you to work alongside? Not because of them for any reason, but you were just nervous to to work with them. Anyone? I mean, Julianne. You know, I was young and I, I loved Boogie Nights, and I I'd seen that like three times in the theater. I think that was that was pretty intimidating when I was younger. Uh, Julian and, and Paul Paul Thomas Anderson? Paul, yeah, but Paul's like my age, and he's just, you know, normal. I mean, I don't know if he's normal, but, like, you know, he just felt like a, a uh, you know, a, uh, a peer, you know. I didn't feel intimidated by him. A kid uh, who somehow got 40 He's a year younger than me, a year older than me, and I'm like, uh, yeah, it's taking me this long. He was, like, 28. I was 27 or something. A three and a half hour opus. Giant, for yeah. Studio. That that people frequently come up to me and tell me is their favorite movie of all time. You know. Really? People come up to you and tell you all make... the time. I hear about that movie more than anything I've ever done. Still, and at the time, people don't realize it. It didn't do well, and it kind of got mixed reviews, and didn't do good business. And you know, I, I think time is the you know the ultimate test of any you know great art or movie or book or music or whatever whatever lasts. Do you have a favorite that you that you were in? Um, I mean, I think the best movie that I'm probably in, if it's not Magnolia, it's The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. I mean, that's a great movie. I mean, I'm not in those movies very much, but I'm really proud to be a part of those. Um, of the movies that I have bigger roles in, I love Great World of Sound. The first movie I did was Obol and Compliance, obviously. Uh, but my favorite thing is Cheap Thrills. As far as my work and, and performance, and I just I love, I love that movie. It's it's not for everybody, but the people it's for, it's really for, you know. Um, and, and that was a, a thing where I really got to do sort of what I was talking about with Taylor, which is just like a range within one role, you know. A character goes from A to Z in... You know, 85 minutes, 90 minutes, whatever it is, um, becomes a completely different person to this, you know, course of events over an evening. Um, did you have a, an instance with this, or not an instance, but did you have a, an experience where you tried to take everything that you learned from the directors that you've worked with over the course of your career and bring it to, to this and then sort of found out that it's actually mostly instinct and your own instinct a lot of the time? It's, own, it's, own, it's my own instinct, but I did learn a lot working on sets. But I just watch movies like People Drink Water, and I just watch them over and over again. And, and because I've been watching some of these movies since I was, you know, five, six years old, they're just in my head. And, and I've, I'll find that I'm doing something on instinct, and I'll look at it later and be like, oh, I just ripped off Spielberg, or that's the Scorsese thing. And I'm certainly really conscious of the two of them the most. Um, Hitchcock, Coen Brothers, De Palma, um, I mean, there's something probably in every frame that is a, a shot or a, a uh, you know, piece of production design or performance thing. You know, I unconsciously imitate actors all the time. I do something because something's stuck in my head. There's, a, there's, a, there's lots of Rupert Pupkin from The King of Comedy. And I did not, I'm not going like, I don't say I'm going to do Rupert Pupkin here, but I, I start yelling and all of a sudden I find... I'm watching it later, and I'm in that rhythm, you know, that, that you know, thing that I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm totally imitating that here. But I'm not aware I'm doing it at the time. It's just so, just part of my DNA at this point. Let's get some questions from the audience. Who is a micro right there? Hey, how are Hi. you? Good. Um, I was wondering if you ran into any challenges directing yourself or if you had kind of a good grasp on that. I felt like I had a good grasp on it. I mean, I had eight months with the script. So I knew the part really well. And what I wanted to be doing was acting on the day. So all of the sort of uh, directing in terms of what the shot compositions were going to be, even what the edits were, things like that. I wasn't at the monitor. I, I had people that I trusted, my DP, my producer. Um, and I just felt like I prepared enough 
so that when I shot, I could just focus on the acting from the day. It did become challenging, as I said, in the editing because I, it, it just, I'm not that in love with the way I look. I, I, I look fine, I'm not complaining, but I, 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 I was really hard on myself in that way. Um, I think working with Taylor, trying to communicate to her, what happens is, is you know, look, I did study the method and, and she did as well and there are different versions of it. And I don't always, I'm not always conscious that it's happening, but I bec I'm becoming the character in an unconscious way. And so sometimes I'm communicating as, and I'm more like Ray, this guy, than me, and I don't know it. And sometimes that can be challenging because I might be hyped up or I might be, also like it's hard to get anybody to take you seriously when you have that on top of your head, you know? <laughs> so that's challenging. You know, all of those things, but I must say I really had a good time shooting. Um, there was a, there's a pretty uh, thorough, intense, prolonged physical fight, uh, physical comedy sequence in the movie that uh, I'm sure you're all gonna love when you see it. That involved a lot of pre-planning and sort of cutting in camera. So it's gonna be this move and that move and it's gonna cut together this way. And I was worried about that. And so that was actually the only thing I watched when we were shooting. We had Brian put together a little assembly of that scene and it was great. I was like, okay, I didn't worry after that. You know, that was like, I don't know, a few days in the shooting or the first week or something like that. I was like, oh, this is, this is working. The tone is, is coming through. The, the fight works. It's funny, all that stuff. So, um, but other than that, I didn't look at dailies or anything while I was shooting. I just didn't have time. Next question. Hey, thanks, Hi. For, being, thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, I read that you had more than one screenplay on the blacklist. And I wondered what that experience was like. Did that open doors for you as a screenwriter? Yeah, I mean, I never really thought I was going to be a writer. I always wanted to make films and act. And uh, I came to L.A. and acting was my way in the door. And then I made this short that I wrote and directed in Sundance, showed it in 2001. And then everyone was like, well, what, do you, what do you want to make? And I didn't write, just hadn't written a script. So I tried writing a script for about five years that was based on the short mullet that I had made. And uh, I just couldn't get anywhere with it. I put it down, got an idea for another script, wrote it in two weeks, ran into an old friend who was, had now become a literary agent. They wanted to rep me. They sent it out on Labor Day of 2006. And the phone never stopped ringing. And that movie is actually getting made this winter. It's called Snow Ponies. It's a Western. Uh, this guy, Darren Prescott, is directing. He's a big second unit uh, stunt guy. Uh, he works with the John Wick guy, so they sort of moved into that position as directors, and now he's moving into that position, and, and Jared Butler is going to be in it. Um, it was a big deal. I felt when that script came out and got the response it did, at that point in my career, I hadn't, like Great World of Sound hadn't come out. I hadn't really been a lead. I'd really just been doing little parts in movies and TV suddenly there was like a decade there where people just knew me as a writer. And it got me in the Writers Guild, which is great, which got me then um, this next job adapting uh, a novel, which also got on the blacklist, uh, a script called Strange Skies. Um, and then I had a career as a writer. And when I got that job writing Strange Skies, um, it was more money than I'd ever been offered in my life, and I said, thank God I don't have to do pilot season this year, which <laughs> I will tell you that I did pilot season. I've been in LA for 19 years. I just booked my first pilot. Wow. And it's not going, but I did a pilot after 19 years. But in that period of time when I was writing, I stopped auditioning for almost everything. There's about three years that I didn't audition. I did a few tiny things, but I didn't act much until Ty West asked me to do The Innkeepers. Yeah, I love that one too. And uh, that actually has opened a, a ton of doors for me as well with directors, because they like that movie a lot, sort of classically directed. Um, but uh, yeah, I was like from 2007 to 2010, I was just writing, and I've continued to. I enjoy it the least out of all the things I do because it's solitary. I like working on sets, I like working with people, so I like acting, I like directing or, or doing anything. Um, you know, that involves working with other people, but, and it's hard, you know, and it's just you. 
um, and it's deeply personal. And it's not physically. I love acting the most because it's it's the physical, it's the mental, it's the emotional. And I guess that's you know as a as a non-religious person person uh, that's as close as I get to spiritual. So you feel like you're kind of channeling something. So I like that the best. But certainly writing open many doors for me writing those scripts and the blacklist yeah everyone ends up reading the scripts that are on the blacklist in fact mike's uh, who wrote my movie his next two scripts are were both on the blacklist last year and one's being shot now so this is his first and then one's being shot now reed morano is directing it with peter dinklage and Elle fanning and paul giamatti and um charlotte gainsborough and then he has another one that uh, i think they're out to actors and directors on now called bad education Cool. I think we have time for one more question right here. Hi. Hi. Um, so between writing, directing, and acting, what kind of stories and what kind of genres kind of are more are, are you more drawn to? I mean, as a movie fan, I love westerns. I love, you know, film noir, which can mean as a pretty broad brush. Lots of movies are noirs. I love crime movies of all kinds. So. Anything from like, you know, out of sight and get shorty to going back to the old noir, you know, Asphalt Jungle, you know, Maltese Falcon. Um, uh, I tend to gravitate towards uh, literature that way too, books. I love crime. I love Elmore Leonard because it's, it's hard boiled and violent, but really funny too. And I think that. Uh, the best dialogue. Yeah. The absolute best. Nobody better. It's almost a cliche to say that. Like, well, I mean, e like... even Tarantino would tell you that his dialogue is just Elmore Leonard dialogue, you know. Um, Pick up an Elmore Leonard book. If you haven't read an Elmore Leonard, it's just, it's mind-blowing how yeah. good it is. And he wrote great westerns, and he wrote great, you know, contemporary <laughs> crime novels, and I don't know how many books he's written. I mean, just tons and tons of books. So, yeah, I, I think in general, I mean, I like everything. I like to try everything. I love musicals, you know. I love... Um, La La Land was great. I love that. Um, my favorite movie last year was the OJ documentary, the Made in America, you know, um, and uh, uh, Paul Verhoeven movie, L. Which that was mine. Yeah, you know, those are great. And great genre mix, or like yeah. he, maybe it was one genre, but he was just putting so many different elements. With I don't know what. Well, yeah, yeah, he just like keeps reinventing cinema in some way keeps going those are the things i'm really drawn to but i'd say yeah you know crime and action westerns are generally crime and action and some contemporary guy shit but like yeah guy but shit. like artistically done yeah exactly yeah, yeah. well crafted guy shit can we say shit yeah we can oh, say you what said it. yeah okay. we can swear yeah okay fuck you want, yeah there you go <laughs> boom there it is uh i gotta let you go i love take me congratulations it opens Thanks, uh it opens may 5th right yeah. uh in theaters and on demand and it'll iTunes. be on demand on itunes may 2nd in uh, theaters limited uh may 5th yeah awesome pat healy everybody thank Thanks, you pat. guys Thanks,